welcome to Hello Nigeria. Now today on the show we're joined with a very talented young woman who has decided to help young people make wise choices with their money. She's a finance expert with 10 years experience in the finance industry and has gone ahead to create a platform Money Africa that helps people make wise financial choices. Today Olua Tosi Olasende is joining us to explain to you all the common mistakes you make with your money, how to navigate it and more importantly a lot of investment advice. So stick around as today's show promises to be enlightening. Thank you so much, Tosin, for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, so let's talk about, you were the founder of Money Africa. Let's talk about your journey into starting Money Africa. So Money Africa is basically your platform by which you encourage and you educate people on wise financial choices. Absolutely. What moved you to start that? Uh, that's a very good question, Ali. So I studied and I lived in South Africa. I started my first job at age of 20. So imagine going from zero salary to 300,000 Naira equivalent when I convert this to African rand to Naira. I was so excited. So finally, I can buy the shoes I used to stay in the mall. I can buy the clothes and all of that. So I worked in South Africa for about four years. If we were to talk, do a total of how much I earned over those, five years, over those four years, over 20 million Naira. But guess what happened? When I was relocating from South Africa to Nigeria, I had a suitcase of clothes, shoes, and tickets of holidays, but I had no investments. It was when I came back to Nigeria, I had just about a month of break before I had to start my new job. And when we were in church, my mom had to squeeze some money into my hand as offering. And I think that day I cried. That was that was a wake up call that I needed to tell a lot of people that we needed to spend our money wisely and also invest it. So that you will never be at a point where if you are temporarily transitioning from one point to another point, then you don't have anything because you've lived from hand to mouth. And that was how Money Africa, the idea came about. Brilliant. What an interesting story. I'm sure many people can relate to this. Because so now let's give in, let's um, use the lessons you've learned, you know, transitioning from one career path or transitioning from one environment to another. There are lessons you've learned in the course of the time and I'm sure if given an opportunity to redo things, you will do things differently. Absolutely. So there are many people who want to transition maybe from um, nine to five work to becoming full-time entrepreneurs and you know, people who are probably moving from one location or one job to another. What would you say from your experience would be the advice that you give to them? I think the very first advice I'm going to give to anybody is number one, to have a budget. It sounds very simple, uh, budget, everybody keeps talking about budgeting, but you'd be amazed the power of this thing. So leverage on technology. We use technology to go on social media, we use technology to buy food, we use technology to even find loved ones. So why don't you also leverage on technology to sort out your finances? So number one, get a budget. Literally write it down. What is my income? How much do I earn? Once you have a number, also track your expenses. How much do I spend? If your expenses is more than your income, it's a loan, it's a debt, it's a problem. So what we are striving for is for our income to be more than our expenses, so we have something to invest. And I always tell people, whenever you set something aside for your future, you're paying yourself first and you're looking after your future. So it was just a month break I had, even though I'd worked for over four years. And in just that, in just that one month, I couldn't survive. I had to get handouts from my parents. So I just want to teach millennials and tell them that you can actually own your future. And it's so amazing the power of having investments. Do you know that lots of entrepreneurs, especially in Africa, they started their business from their own savings and investments. And 70 whopping percent actually do that. So if you don't even have any money you've invested or saved, many people keep talking about, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to start my own business. If you don't have something stashed away, how do you make this dream come true? Well, so 70 percent of entrepreneurs start their businesses from their own personal savings. Absolutely. So let's talk about loans. What's your take on loans? I'm very happy you asked that question. A lot of people actually have a perception that a loan is a bad thing. Even some religious organizations also say things like, oh, you don't take loans. Loan is not good for, you know, things like that. But in actual fact, there is nothing wrong with a loan. At my last stroll at a multinational, we had some of the banks actually coming to approach us for a loan. If, if you can get a loan, you know what that means? Number one, that means that they think you can pay back. So that sets you apart from the lower income or bottom of pyramid market that do not actually have access to that loan. So now that you being able to access loan is a huge privilege on its own, the number two question you need to be asking yourself is what am I using that loan for? So we have two kinds of loan. We have a good loan and a bad loan. A good loan is when you spend that loan on something that you can earn a future benefit from. So it could be things like education, it could be a house, it could be an investment, you know, something that you know that will turn back to you in the future. A bad loan is when you just consume it and it has no hopes of giving you anything back. So like marrying a second wife <laughs> or you know, just splurging or just spending just for the sakes of it. So getting a loan is not a bad thing. Then number two, the cost of the loan. So 
many people actually don't even know the cost of this lunch. So I was speaking to a friend. I said, oh, Tosin, um, I got money from this organization. I said, madam, how much is it? And then she checked. It was actually 10% per month. If you look at it from an annual point of view, that is about 120% per annum. So it is imperative that you actually check the fine lines and you see what is the cost of this loan. Can I afford this loan? So please, a loan is not a bad thing. You can expand it to get future benefit, but check for the cost. If you can't afford it, don't touch it. All right, let's look at our savings culture. We don't necessarily have a healthy saving culture. When we're younger, we used to have piggy banks. Yes. You know, but our parents all collected the money and told us they would buy socks for Christmas and use it for their personal money. Thank you very much, mommy and daddy. And for all the other mommies and daddies sitting on that table, we thank you very much. But let's talk about saving. What would you say are uh, some of the quick ways to inculcate a savings habit? More, is, more importantly, because there are many reasons people give you why they don't save. I don't earn enough. You know, I have only one job. We just think until you have a job on the side, that's when you should save. So how can you inculcate a saving habit? And how, how important is it really? It's very, very important. And a lot of people tell me, Tosin, I don't earn enough money, so I don't want to save. And I keep telling them this. I saw a lady this morning before I entered this office, very fit. So I asked her, what do you do? And she was like, oh, I exercise. Savings is like a muscle. You need to actually train it. So with that 100,000 Naira a month, with that 80,000 Naira a month, whatever you're earning, start training yourself so that when you get more, you've already built the muscle to be able to handle it. So many people, when they even get to their desired income, they've not trained for it. So there's a tendency to just splurge. Before you know what happens, they're upgrading their housing. They're screwing on holidays. They're tensioning people on the Instagram because they're not used, they've not trained themselves. So consider this, whatever point you are with an income level, it's an opportunity for you to actually train yourself and you'll be amazed as to how it goes. So now let's talk about savings as a culture. Um, when we were growing up, yes, I know that my parents used to say, okay, now save and then they might end up not giving it back to you. But I think one thing we need to do better as parents is to actually start speaking to our children early about savings and investment. Did you know that Warren Buffett bought his first stock at the age of 11? For him to have bought that stock at 11, he must have been stashing it away, little, little money somewhere, and then his parents must have told him about it, and he must have then gone to the stock market to go buy some stock. So we need to start having that conversation early. You know, get the children involved. Let them understand the, the theory of opportunity cost. Or if I buy that top that is slightly cheaper, and I have a little more to then put aside, you know, just like a muscle, we start training it. So saving is very, very critical. And also, another element that I keep forgetting to talk about is about the peace of mind. There's just that peace knowing that I have an emergency fund. If anything happens, I have something to quickly fall back on. For many people now, if an unexpected thing happens, they'll have to start calling that uncle, that auntie, that neighbor. And sometimes, all these people that you call for help might not be able to help you, not because they're necessarily wicked, but because they're also going through their own, you know, normal life things. So, I always tell people, you can be your own shore banker. You might, you can be that person you can fall back on by planning and saving in advance. So, it is very critical that we actually learn how to save. How has social media really affected the savings culture? Hmm. I know that <laughs> um, social media, based on research, it has helped peak consumption. So, you know, you're just scrolling through the gram and you see with that lovely dress. Even now, you see that a lot of millennials are traveling more. Um, they were asking a question that if you, didn't, if you were to go on a holiday and you didn't have to show anybody, would you actually go on that trip? And many people were like, oh, okay, I might not go. So we're now, the consumption market is actually growing because the product is in your face. You have people to show it to and things like that. It's basically not preparing the ground. Exactly. And which is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, if I manufacture clothes, I'm going to be very happy because now I can turn my revenue over because I can, I'm now in the faces of my consumer. But you must remember that... At the end of the day, everything is balanced. Imagine you're doing all that work and working so hard and you're just investing everything and you're not enjoying yourself. It's not wisdom. So just strike on the balance. And that's why we always come back to having a budget. So there's a principle called a 50, 30, 20. So it means that 50% of what you earn goes towards your essentials, things like your rent, your electricity, the petrol you're going to put in your car, food, you understand? Then 30% is towards things that you can live without. So your friend is getting married, you want to give her a gift. Um, you want to do a little bit of a luxury, you know? You want to you want to do things that will not affect your, that you can do without. Then another 20% is investment, meaning that you always have to stash something aside. Did you know that if you invest 25% of your income on a monthly basis at the end of the year, guess what? You have three months equivalent of money stashed away. So people always say the 13th bonus. So just by you investing, you literally have a 15th check. So you have three months of salary stashed somewhere else because every month without fail, you take it away 25% of your income and you we'll throw it We'll come to off. investment in a moment, but let's talk about savings for a bit. 
what's the percentage that an individual should save the least percentage an individual should save and how can we inculcate that discipline of saving because as you're saying it is sounding really fancy but putting it into action is another thing and that, you are absolutely right like it's so much easier to save getting the work than is actual work and that is why we need to actually have that budget so that principle of 50 30 20 is advising that we save at the minimum 20 percent of what you earn while that is fantastic and that is great there are some times when it will not apply so for instance let's say you're a young person you're living in your parents house you're not paying rent remember they already said that 50 percent should go towards essentials but because you are shielded you don't have that cost then you can do more you can save more than 20 percent another time when saving more than 20 percent will work is let's say you're a single woman you don't have the responsibility of paying school fees you don't have the responsibility of getting domestic help and things like that you have a propensity to actually go higher on that percentage ranking another time when you don't have to save 20 percent you can actually save more is if you're any more in nominal terms let's do the math somebody is earning a hundred thousand naira now and then they're able to save twenty thousand naira every month fantastic nigeria is expensive let's say you start any three hundred thousand naira 20% of 300,000 Naira is how much? That's just 60,000 Naira. So you see, how can you move from any 100,000 Naira to 300,000 Naira? You're only now increasing your savings from 20,000 to 60,000. It doesn't make sense. So you can then increase your percentage. So yes, we like to use 20% as a benchmark, but you can actually do more depending on your personal circumstance. Now, how do we build the discipline? You can do that by number one, automation. What is automation? Automation means that you've told your bank that the day I get paid, move this money into another account that I don't have access to. So even if you cry and wail and want it, it's, you can't spend money you don't have. And that's how I always train myself. If the money is not in my account, there's nothing I can do about it. So that's a get it off your hands. So that way, even if you're tempted, you can't access it. You can't well. access it. Fantastic idea. Let's talk about investments now. So for young people, millennials, who basically want to go into investment but don't know the things that they can, you know, the areas they can invest in, what advice would you give to them? And I'm really happy we're talking about it because number one, it's one to save. But if you're not investing, you're actually cheating yourself. So before we talk about investment, there's something called inflation. So what is inflation? Inflation means the general increases in prices of goods and services. So let's say, for instance, my landlord is going to increase my rent. Let's say, hypothetically, I'm earning or I'm paying rent of 500,000 naira. If my landlord is going to increase my rent from 500,000 naira to 700,000 naira in two years' time, I want to be able to invest 500,000 naira somewhere that it will make 200,000 naira return, so that when I'm paying my rent in two years' time, I have enough money to. Pay my new rent and basically that is what inflation is trying to solve so as the prices are increasing my investment also needs to be increasing at the same level so that I can beat inflation so that my my money will not lose its value so what are the products you could invest in just to beat inflation we have something called the Treasury bill we have the government bonds and we have the money market mutual fund so these products are targeted at fighting inflation just to preserve the value of that money did you know that with as little as 10,000 naira you can actually open any of these accounts so our parents then did not have the opportunity of investing in this kind of product because they always had to do everything in bulk amount but now the beautiful thing about our generation is that we have the option because we have smaller entry point so imagine I just get a loose 20k so I can quickly just go and throw it in my money market mutual fund account somebody just gave, gave me 30,000 naira or I just got a business that I was not expecting so because I know that I don't have to wait for it to be 1 million to start investing I can start where I am with what so is the money mutual funds account accessible to all banks yes it is accessible to all banks so you can just go to your bank and asking for a money market mutual fund account and you can start saving investing with as little as 10,000 so what that does it doubles your money sort of it, I'm very happy you're happy asking that question so basically what it does is this the interest rate on the money market mutual fund account because the money market mutual fund invest in things like treasury bills, government bonds, and commercial papers. What are these three instruments? These three instruments, um, like a treasury bill for instance, let's say the government needs some money. They come to the general public and say, oh, we need some money. But guess what? If you don't have up to 50 million naira, the central bank is not going to take your money from you so the banks will go around maybe take 100k from you take 10,000 from that other person they put all the money together and then they get 50 million and then they go to the central bank of Nigeria to invest in the treasury bill so the interest rate on a treasury bill and the inflation rates they go side by side in summary in simple terms what this product tries to do is to fight inflation so that I can preserve the value of that money so that that is basically what a money market mutual fund does all right I'm hoping that by the time this conversation is done some of you would already be making your minds up to call your banks tomorrow to go open your money market mutual funds account so in conclusion let's talk about the most common financial mistakes that people make and ways to go around them 
Do you know that the biggest mistake a lot of millennials make is actually diversification? Let me tell you what they do. So somebody calls them up now. Ah, have you heard about this business deal? Come and invest. They don't do any form of research and then they put their money into it. So we're talking about risk management. Individuals do not manage their risk management. So let's say you're earning like, let's say what, 200,000 now. You've been saving money diligent and let's say you have just about 150,000 dollars saved somebody called you about a business opportunity and you went and you throw in all your 150,000 it's not wisdom so what we need to be doing now is to be looking at how can we put our portfolio in such a way that is diversified let me tell you how the rich invest the rich puts 35 percent of their money in safety so when i'm talking about safety i'm talking about money market mutual fund or cash or things like that so if anything happens you can sleep at night 35 percent is in safety so another 38 percent they put it in the stock market so a stock market is having a slice of a company so let's say a bank stock grows from five naira to ten naira you also take an opportunity to enjoy that growth you can also enjoy dividend and things like that so the mistake a lot of millennials do is that we put all our money in one place which is not wisdom so you're either taking too much risk or taking too little risk and we need to stop doing that we need to start doing what the world is diversified so we put some money in safety like the rich will do that is to protect their money in case of anything you can't predict the future and he also put some money in what risky assets that give you an opportunity to do what to grow so i'm talking about stock i'm talking about um agri technology i'm talking about real estate so yes another mistake a lot of millennials do is that we eat from hand to mouth preparing people that you might not see again in the future so we preparing need to stop doing that you understand so Every time I keep telling myself, if I invest, I'm looking out for Oluwatosin. So we need to start thinking that way that if I put some money aside, I'm protecting my future, I'm protecting my children's future, I'm giving, going to give my children a better chance and better education. The things, the opportunities my parents couldn't give me, I'll be able to then give it to them. So these are the things to motivate you to actually invest. Okay, we've had such a fantastic time with Oluwatosin Olasayinde, the founder CEO of Money Africa, and she's basically opened our eyes to some of the things we've been sleeping on. So I'm hoping that after this conversation, and lots of people are going to really duct their acts together and I will make more wise financial or wiser financial choices. All right, thank you very much for joining us on the show today. This is Hello Nigeria. We've been speaking about money, everything money, but the show continues right after this break. Thank you for joining us on today's show. We hope that you've had a good time and that you've learned a few new things as well. Or maybe be reminded of things you already knew. We're still here with we Remo Adeunia. We just want to wrap up the show by talking about what seems like good news in the eyes of many. The fact that reports have reached us that the U.S. Embassy has said that the ban on issuing visa to Nigerian students is a lie. So uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? You know, there, was, there, was, there were rumors going around saying that the United States had banned given U.S. visa to Nigerian students, but now the United States mission in Nigeria has come forward to debunk the rumor that it's no longer issuing student visas to Nigerians. Is it good news? Well, yes, but I mean, these stories make me feel sad. I mean, in the U.S., Nigeria has the highest number of students, of foreign students. Most of the foreign students are Nigerians. I mean, over 16,000 students uh, are from Nigeria in the U.S. So question is, it again reflects on what's wrong with us at, at home, uh, our educational system. Why are students rushing to leave Nigeria uh, to go study abroad? I mean, these things should help us reflect on our system and maybe help us, you know, make it better. Is it good news? Yes, because I know what fake news could do, especially if you're in the process of, you know, of getting your maybe scholarship or whatever. Should you seek uh, study abroad, of course, by all means, it's your, it's your right to do so. But I think that if we have quality education here, like they do in Rwanda, I mean, many of the uh, public schools are shutting down. Why? Because the public schools were made functional. I mean, it's just natural. It just happens. You don't have the to tell them to shut down. Shut, they yeah. would naturally shut down. We had this conversation on my show on radio today. Yesterday was the day of the African child. And the question was, is education good enough? So if government makes public education good enough, naturally people will put their children in the public schools and then the private schools will have no need to open. I mean, I had very shocking statistics today. One of our guests mentioned, I need to verify this,
But he said that in Lagos, we have about 1,500 government schools in all. And we have about 8,000 private schools. I think there should even be more. All this mushroom. Very true. And that's know, because people don't trust the quality of education that the government schools they have to they offer. Don't. So they I think don't. this is food for thought. As yeah. much as people are excited at the fact that they can finally send their children to study abroad or they themselves can go to study abroad, we must start to reflect and look within. How better can we make our education system from the failing, you know, the failing from the government and from the standard of education, from the quality of teachers and lecturers, mm -hmm. from inf to infrastructure, and just basically having good life, giving Nigerian students a good and a comfortable life. And where we could start that from is amending the constitution. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a under the law. You can't sue as a child. You have a right to quality education up to tertiary level, but you can't sue if you don't have quality education. So if you can't hold the government accountable to what they've written in the constitution, like someone said, they gave it to you with the right hand and, and collected collect it with the, left. with the left. And also trying to even see that we, our budget, we increase our budgetary allocation to yes. education. We're not even doing up to the uh, you, you know global standards. We're not yeah. even doing double double digits yet. There's so much that we need we to do. We have Nigeria keeps arguing that it's just about 10 million children. They say just. I don't even understand how <laughs> so 10.5 million is just. Uh, so there are global reports about we has having 13.5 13 million, million children. Yeah. Every five children who is out of school is it's a, a Nigerian, Nigerian child. child. Exactly. Those are sad, sad, shocking statistics. But we'll leave you with that piece of, you know, that food for thought to deliberate on that and to think about that. Let's all together put our hands together and see how we can make our country a better place. But that's all we have for you. We'll see you again tomorrow. Good night. To enjoy more of this, our Ugonke videos when you just watch. Press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.